This lesson is on modeling change. And let's start by reviewing that an ordinary differential equation, or an ODE, uh, is just an equation for an unknown function of one variable involving derivatives of that function. And most often, we're going to model change with an ODE of the form dx dt equals f of x and t. So remember here, you look at this, you think x is the dependent variable, t is the independent variable, my unknown, fu my unknown function is x of t, and here f of x and t is some rule that goes on the right-hand side of the differential equation, and that rule prescribes all the details of how x changes with t. Okay? And we don't do this just for fun. Um, the reason, I mean, it is fun, but the reason we're doing this is because sometimes the only knowledge we have is the knowledge of how something changes, right? We might only know the f part of this equation, and then in order to find out about the x part, to find out the unknown function, we then have to solve or study the differential equation. Okay? So that's what this lesson is really about. It's mostly going to be about going from words to differential equations. Can you take words and translate them into a differential equation um, when you have knowledge of how something changes but you want to know about the thing itself? It's worth mentioning that the reverse is also a useful skill. We'll do this just a little bit at the end to be able to look at an ordinary differential equation and interpret it. And that is basically be able to explain what a given ODE describes. So let's uh, go through some examples, a bunch of examples to run through with you here. First, pollutant in a lake. The quantity of pollutant in a lake decreases at a rate proportional to the quantity present. Well, first thing, let's figure out the dependent variable. It's the quantity of pollutant. We'll call that Q. The independent variable is time. And so our strategy is always to start in words and basically write down on the left-hand side rate of change of our quantity of the pollutant and on the right-hand side, just things that make it increase or decrease. So the way we translate the phrase rate of change of pollutant into mathematics is just dq dt. That means the instantaneous rate of change of the pollutant. Um, then we have rate of increase minus rate of decrease. Well, there's nothing in the verbal description that says that the amount of the pollutant is increasing. So this rate of increase here, this is actually zero for us. The rate of decrease, we're told, is proportional to the quantity present. And if you think way back to the start of this course when we discussed proportionality, proportionality means a constant times. So I'm going to write minus kq. So this is our differential equation. This is the, the word problem translated into math. Um, and when we write it this way, this unknown number, this unknown constant of proportionality q, um, has to be a positive number. And to check that this makes sense, we know that Q is positive because the quantity of pollutant in a lake can't be negative. So Q either has to be zero or positive. If K is positive, then minus KQ is minus a positive times a positive. That's a negative number. That makes sense. DQ DT equals something negative. That means the derivative is negative, so Q should be decreasing. That's all consistent. If instead we made Q, it's, or sorry, if instead we made K itself a negative number, we would have a minus sign times a negative times a positive, that would be positive, and Q would be increasing, which is not what we intend to model. So uh, this is the way we write it, and it's always just good to state what sign your constants must have. Example number two is a savings account earning interest. So your savings account earns 3% per year, let's say, compounded continuously. Um, and so our dependent variable will be your balance in your savings account, probably measured in dollars, we'll call that B. And the independent variable is going to be time measured in years, we'll call that T. And the strategy is rate of change of your balance is rate of increase minus rate of decrease. Mathematically, rate of change of balance we write as dBdt. The rate of increase, well, 3% per year, 3% of what? That means 3% of your balance. So 3% of your balance is 0.03b. There's no decrease here. There's nothing that's causing your balance to decrease. So we end up with this differential equation, dp dt equals 0.03b. And if you think back to earlier in this course and you remember solving interest problems, you might even already know what uh, function uh, this unknown function v of t is. And I'll remind you, it's exponential growth is what you get when you have continuously compounded uh, interest. All right, now similarly, we're going to have your same savings account, but we're going to make withdrawals. 
and we're going to withdraw $100 per year. So now the rate of change of your balance should be rate of increase minus rate of decrease. The increase is due to earning interest, but there's a decrease now that's due to withdrawals. So dBdt is going to equal 0.03b as before, but then minus whatever the rate of withdrawals is, and it's just $100 per year. It's a fixed, fixed rate, $100 per year. No matter what your balance is, you're always taking out $100 per year. So this is the differential equation we get. dBdt is 0.03b minus 100. And of course, this kind of assumes that everything is happening continuously, like your $100 is being withdrawn um, spread out over the year. And I think this is a fine assumption to make because this is a mathematical model. Next example is from pharmacokinetics, which sort of means how drugs are processed in your body. So let's pretend there's a patient who's given an IV antibiotic uh, at the rate of 85 milligrams per hour. The drug is metabolized and then excreted from the body at a rate that's proportional to the quantity present. And the proportionality constant is 0.1. So our dependent variable is the amount of drug in the body. That's Q. I should say it's uh, measured in milligrams. And the independent variable here is time in hours. So the strategy is always the same. Rate of change of the amount of drug is rate of increase minus rate of decrease. The increase is due to the IV drip. The decrease is due to excretion. We're told the increase is a fixed amount. It's 85 milligrams per hour. So the IV drip increase gives us this 85. Excretion is at a rate proportional to quantity present present with that constant equaling 0.1. So I write 0 0.1 times the quantity present, which is just Q, and we get our final differential equation uh, for our pharmacokinetics problem here. Next example, this is one I love. This is logistic population growth. So a population of bacteria in a Petri dish grows proportionally to the product of the current population, P, and the difference between something called the carrying capacity, K, and the current population. So it might be hard to understand why this might be true, but just accept it for now. We'll translate it into math. The dependent variable is the number of bacteria. We'll call it N. The independent variable is time, which we'll call T. So dN dt equals, well, it's proportional to a product. So my constant of proportionality here, I'm going to call R. And the product is the current population, which this should say n, I apologize, um, and the, carry, the difference between the carrying capacity and the current population. So that's k minus n. So again, it's a constant times the product of the population and the difference between the population and something called the carrying capacity. And here, these two parameters, r and k, they're both uh, positive numbers greater than zero. Now, if you don't have any intuition for you know why this equation might make sense let's actually expand it uh, and I'm going to call the product of R and K a new number alpha just for convenience so I'll write dn dt equals alpha n minus R n squared alpha n minus R n squared so here this term is the term that's causing things to increase it's the term with a positive sign and you can think of this, this is kind of like the term for interest growing in your bank account. Here what's going on is just bacteria reproducing, right? So you can think of this as increase due to reproduction. Then we have minus Rn squared. So this is our decrease because of the minus sign. And this is a decrease that's due to limited resources. So those bacteria in the Petri dish, they don't have an infinite amount of space or an infinite amount of food to eat in whatever medium they're growing on, sugar water or something. They're limited resources. So one way that you could think of this term is that they're dying off. It's decreasing the population um, when N interacts with itself. And this is often described with the product, right? N times N equals N squared this represents interaction of the population with itself, okay? And you could think of this as like a competitive interaction. There's not enough sugar water for all of those bacteria, so they gotta compete with each other. And this results in a reduction of 
the rate, right? It, it wants to make the rate of change of the number of bacteria more negative. This is a really important population growth model. It's called the logistic model. And you'll probably study it a little bit more in a future screencast. Now let's now that we're talking about interactions a little bit, let's bump this up, and instead of talking about a single differential equation, let's talk about pairs of interacting differential equations. This is going to be interacting populations. And we're going to imagine that there's an isolated island, and it has a population of robins and worms, and these change over time. The number of robins is R of t, and the number of worms is W of t. And let's just focus on the left side of this slide for now. And in the absence of robins, worms reproduce with a fixed birth rate, okay? So reproduction, we know we can just describe kind of like our dollars growing in our bank account. However, the presence of robins, if there are robins there, it reduces the worm population at a rate proportional to the number of encounters. What do we mean by encounters? Well, we mean that a robin runs into a worm and he eats it. That's called predator-prey. The, the robin's the predator, the worm is the prey. We can also assume, and this is an assumption, that the number of encounters between robins and worms is jointly proportional, which means proportional to the product of, the number of robins and worms. So think about that. If I write down the product of the number of robins and worms, and we think about the encounters of those two populations, well, if the encounters are proportional to this, then the more robins there are, the more encounters you get, or the more worms there are, the more encounters you get. Increasing either one increases the product. So that's the simplest way to model this. And so we can now try to take all of this and turn it into words. We're going to start by writing the mathematical expression for rate of change of the worm population. That's dw dt. Then we have the bit that says that in the absence of robins, worms reproduce with a fixed birth rate, like 3% per year or something. That's this term where A is the birth rate and W like a percentage and W is the population. And then we know that the presence of robins reduces the worm population at a rate proportional to the number of count encounters or that is proportional to the product of the two populations. So since it's decreasing things we have a minus sign. B is a constant of proportionality and then we have the product of robins and worms. On the right-hand side here, we need an equation, a differential equation for the robins. Um, and in the absence of worms, robins die at some fixed percentage rate per year, 5% per year or something. And that's because they don't have any food to eat. So we can describe that um, as drdt, rate of change of the robins, equals minus cr, where c is a positive constant. So this is causing the robin population to decrease. This is a decrease term, um, and it's just them dying off at some fixed percentage. But when they encounter each other, when robins and worms encounter each other, this causes the robin population to increase because the, these robins finally get some food. So they're able to eat the food, be healthy, um, and, and, you know, and so forth. So uh, the number of encounters is, again, proportional to the product of the two, R, W, and D is our constant of proportionality that measures how much those interactions actually help the robin population. So these are the two equations together, this one here and this one here. Just so you don't lose sight of things, this is two ordinary differential equations. There's one independent variable, T, but there are two dependent variables, W and R. So the unknown functions are W of T, that's my funny looking W, and R of T. Okay, and the goal is that eventually you would hope to be able to study these differential equations, knowing what you do about the rules for how these, how these things change, you'd be able to actually figure out what W and R are. Here's another problem, this is about epidemic disease. So imagine that there's some transmissible disease in a population, maybe something like measles. Basically the population is divided up into three classes. People can either be susceptible to the disease, which means they're healthy and they can get it, um, they're infected with the disease, meaning that they're sick, or else they're removed from the population, either because they've had the disease gotten better and then have immunity, or else it's killed them. But either way, they, they don't become susceptible again. And a typical way to visualize a situation like this is with a little kind of flow diagram of boxes where our susceptible, infected, and removed people, like susceptible, infected, moved, and 
you know, you flow from being susceptible to infected if you get sick, and then if you're infected, you flow to removed. And here are the uh, here are the assumptions. Susceptibles become infected at a rate that's proportional to their encounters uh, with where encounters means with sick people, right? So it's like you go into the uh, elevator at work and somebody with a cold sneezes on you and then there's some chance you get sick from that, all right? So we can already take that and translate that into a differential equation. So susceptibles will let them be equal to S of T, right, S of T. And so the rate of change, ds dt, equals, well, they become infected, so they move from s to i. That's going to decrease the number of s's. So getting sick decreases the number of s's. So I'm going to write a minus sign. And then we know it's proportional to their encounters. So sort of like with our predator-prey example, there's a constant of proportionality. I'll call it a. And the encounters between the sick and infected people will be jointly proportional to the number of each. So I have the product s times i. So ds dt equals minus a s times i. a here measures kind of like the transmissibility of the disease. How likely is it that when you sneeze on me, I'm going to get sick? Okay, now uh, the very first thing is that we should then write down an equation for the infected, di dt equals, and there's something that causes it to, to increase, which is when those susceptibles get sick. So exactly the susceptibles who get sick from those encounters who are leaving the susceptible class, they're entering the infected class. So the same term that appears with a minus sign up here appears with a plus sign down here, ASI. At the same time, there's something that causes the number of infected to decrease, and that's people being removed from the population. And so we're going to assume, or the, the the modeling assumption uh, is that they're removed at a constant percentage, right? Kind of like when we had a constant death rate in previous problems, but maybe a nicer way to think about it here is that people sort of spend a fixed amount of time being sick, so every day, you know, 3% of the population gets better or something like that. So we have a minus since this causes the number of infected to decrease, and it's some percentage, which we're calling V times I. And here are these parameters, A and V, are both greater than zero. So this is the very most kind of fundamental epidemic disease model. It's called the SI model. Sometimes you see it called the kermack mckendrick model. Um, it's really cool. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with it, and it has a lot of historical significance. All right, and, uh, last example here. This is to go the opposite direction. This is to go from an equation uh, into words. Try to understand it uh, and state in words what the equation is saying. So pretend you take an object out of the oven at time t equals zero. Uh, its temperature, which we'll call q of t, starts to change, right? It's hot at first, but maybe not afterwards, once you take it out. The environment outside of the oven, we'll say, is at e degrees. And there's something called Newton's law of cooling, and it's this differential equation, dq dt equals minus k q minus e, where k is a positive constant. Well, if I asked you for the verbal description of this, you would say the object's rate of change of temperature, right, rate of change of temperature is dq dt, and you'd say it is proportional to, so minus k, that's a constant of proportionality, and then you'd say the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the environment. This is the temperature of the object. This is the temperature of the environment. That's just taking the equation and stating in words what it says. And this also makes sense, right? So if K is a positive constant, um, then think about our hot item. Q is big compared to E. It's hotter the, than the environment. So Q minus E is positive. A positive times k is still positive, since k is positive. But then we put a negative sign in front of it. That makes the whole thing negative. dq dt is negative. That makes sense. Your hot thing is going to cool down. Temperature is going to decrease. On the other hand, this exact same equation can also be called Newton's law of heating. Because if you did the opposite, if you started out with a value of q that was really cold, colder than the environment, then q minus e would be a negative number. Right? E would be greater in magnitude than Q. So this would be a negative number. You'd have a negative times a positive is a negative, uh, but a negative times this negative sign gives you a positive. DQ, DT is positive, and your cold object wants to heat up. 
So I want you to go ahead and ask yourself if you can sort of do this exercise in both directions. If you can um, set up equations given a verbal description, and if you can take an equation and give a verbal description that goes with it. Those are the two big goals here. Uh, thanks for listening, and that's the end of this lesson.